Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk on the National Underground Asset Register, or NUR. Uh, we've got an update for you. We'll give an overview of NUR, our approach, progress to date, and timelines for the future. And NUR is part of the government's efforts to build back better and greener with tangible benefits and to speed up the delivery of housing and infrastructure projects from design to build. So we'll be uh, getting an update on the fast access to underground asset data uh, uh, work that's been going on uh, that's going to save utilities, companies, local authorities time and money. So to give us this talk, we have three speakers who uh, are Guy Ledger. He's Digital Director for Atkins UK Infrastructure Division, which provides engineering design and consultancy services to the public and private sector across the UK. He's a civil engineer. Over the past four years, he's led a particular focus on how organisations can create value for through better data sharing. We have Bob Chell, uh, joining, uh, who joined One Spatial in 1998. His primary areas of interest are in harnessing cognitive diversity, rules-based patterns, data modeling, geospatial data management, quantitative data, quality management techniques, and spatial data infrastructures. And also we have Helen Markides, who's developed a career across policy, project management, monitoring, and evaluation in the both public and private sector. And Helen leads two digital projects, London's Underground Asset Register and the Infrastructure Mapping Application. Uh, Guy, I think you're going to start us off. I will. Robin, thank you very much for that introduction um, and welcome uh, to everyone on the call. Thank you very much for joining our presentation today. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm Guy Ledger. I'm project director for the National Underground Asset Register project. And it's my responsibility to make sure that we deliver a successful outcome for Geospatial Commission. So I'm joined by my two colleagues, um, Helen and Bob. Um, and between us, we would like to talk to you about three things. One is, um, firstly, I'm going to give you an overview of the NUAR project. I'm then going to hand over to Helen and Helen's going to go on to tell you about how we are engaging with all of the asset owners, all of the owners of underground assets, i.e., all of the owners of the pipes and wires beneath our feet. And then Bob will then speak to you about how we're seeking to access um, access that underground asset data, and then map that data into the um, into new our international underground asset register that we're building. So let me start um, by giving you um, an overview of um, giving an overview of the National Underground Asset Register. I'm going to talk about kind of what NUAR is, um, why it's needed, um, the benefits that it will drive and that it will create, um, and then a quick summary of where we are today and where we're going. So what is NUAR? Um, well, or rather, I should say, what will NUAR be? So essentially, NUAR is a secure cloud-based platform, or more accurately, I should, I should maybe say that it's going to be a service, and it will do three things. Firstly, asset owners, such as local authorities or utilities, or any, any organisation that owns the pipes and wires beneath our feet, they will be able to make their data much more readily available to organizations who are seeking to dig or excavate the ground. Secondly, organizations who then want to know the location of buried pipes and, and wires, they can, get that access, they can get that information much more easily in one place to their phone, to their tablet, or to their, to their laptop or their computer. And then lastly, when someone is digging a hole and they discover that something is different, it can be recorded and it can be shared back to those um, to those utility and um, underground asset owners. But then why do we need it? And what is the problem that NUAR is seeking to solve? Well, the, the answer here is quite simple. Currently, there's something like four million excavations that are carried out every year. And anyone who is planning one of these excavations is obliged to acquire information about the location of all the buried services before they start their work, before they dig a hole. And that information is dispersed and it's fragmented. It's held separately by each individual asset owner organization. The data varies in format and quality, 
And the process for acquiring that information and data, it can be slow, it can be time consuming. And sometimes that causes people to kind of cut corners and take risks. And when you put all of these factors together, they elevate the likelihood of a utility strike. And there are something like 60,000 utility strikes each year. That's something that's more than 160 per day. And every incident has the potential to cause either kind of serious injury or even death. Utility strikes have caused disruption for everyone, for road users, for pedestrians, for local residents, local businesses, for schools, for emergency services. You know, the list is, is, is really long. Repairing those broken assets causes noise, it causes pollution. And with any construction activity, there is also then that carries a carbon impact as well. So ultimately, um, utility strikes lead to, to unnecessary carbon. And then lastly, at the end of the day, the cost of repairing those assets flows through to, to higher customer bills for their water, their gas, or their electric, or their telecoms, but also can flow through to higher council tax charges. So by solving this problem, there are lots of people that are gonna benefit. There are the asset owners themselves who will be able to share the location of their assets more easily, speedily and efficiently. So that will save them time and money. It will be easier and faster for planners and excavators to get access to the location of buried assets, making their jobs easier, particularly when planning emergency works. They'll be able to plan and dig a hole with more confidence. There'll be benefits for people who are responsible for managing data and protecting assets. And of course, there's going to be the benefit to the general public and from businesses from the reduced disruption. Now, work done by Geospatial Comm Commission estimates that the total annual cost of um, striking underground assets costs the UK economy something that's an eye-watering amount of money, something like two and a two and a half, 2.4 billion pounds per year. And these are avoidable costs, and as, and as such, they really can't be ignored. With NUR in place, the study shows that um, we can make some savings against those, those utility strikes, and that will amount to, a, to an annual saving of 350 million pounds per year. So against this figure, the cost of implementing the NUR, the, the NUR platform, the NUR, NUR service, it has a return of something like a 30-fold benefit. And this is one of the highest cost benefit ratios of any public sector investment currently in, in play. So from a government point of view, this project is highly desirable and it's a high, high beneficial major project. And at the risk of repeating myself, these benefits will then manifest themselves at local level too. So they'll through reduced disruption, reduced pollution, more efficient planning, lower avoidable costs caused by kind of accommodating unforeseen issues from, from poor data. And lastly, NUR has the potential to unlock other use cases and benefits down the line, such as um, better street works coordination. Now, I'm not, gonna, um, I'm not gonna dwell on this slide other than to say NUR is being delivered by an array of organizations and parts of government in a really truly collaborative way and I think we're illustrating that today by, by the three of us on this call but probably most notably from this slide is that the team includes the includes CPNI and the um, NCSC both the kind of the security agencies and both are integral to this project making sure that the way that we execute the project um, is safe and secure but most importantly, that the newer platform and the service that we're creating will be a, a secure and safe system. Now, we started the project last September. Um, our timeline is to have a fully operational national platform available and ready by September 2024. Um, and whilst that might seem like a long way off, um, you need to bear in mind that the challenge involved is quite significant. So we have more than 650 asset owners that we need to engage with and we need to acquire their data. We also need to build a system that will ingest all of that data in a repeatable and sustainable way into a standard model 
and then display that data in an aggregated format through effectively through a single window. So meeting this challenge, there are three key enablers. Um, there are three kind of key, key instruments. Firstly, there's something called the data expiration agreement. And this is an agreement between the asset owner and Atkins as the, as the delivery partner here. And that enables us to um, access your data and then do the necessary work to work out how we transform and ingest that data ultimately into the, into the system. The second instrument here is something called the data ingestion specification. And the data ingestion specification makes sure that we then have the right ongoing alignment of the asset owner source data and that we understand the model for mapping that into the new R platform going forwards. And then the third key enabler is the data distribution agreement. And then this is an agreement between the asset owner and cabinet office, so government, and that then allows the publishing of that data to the new R platform um, in the future on an ongoing basis. So we're six months into the project and we are on track and we're where we want to be. By the end of March, we will have a working version of the platform ready for user research. And focusing on three initial regions, to date we have engaged with something two, like 250 asset owners already out of the 650. Um, we have almost 80 that are already signed up to the data expiration agreements. 35 uh, asset owners have provided their data to us and we're in progress of, of transforming that data. And two asset owners have signed up to the long-term data distribution agreement. So right now we're in really good shape. We have the necessary momentum, but the success of the project um, hinges on engaging and onboarding each and every organization that owns or is responsible for the assets under, un, underneath our feet. So with that, I'm gonna hand over now to Helen Marquis from GLA, who's gonna tell you something about how we're engaging with asset owners, particularly local authorities, and how we're on board, seeking to onboard their data to the project. Helen. Thanks, Guy. Um, so, so like I said, I'm, I'm Helen. I work at the Greater London Authority, or GLA. Um, GLA has been involved in New Art right from the very beginning, back in 2019, when it was just a pilot project. And we're um, delighted to be working alongside Atkins, One Spatial and the Geospatial Commission, um, to now be building out an operational platform. So I'm going to talk today about our approach to onboarding, and I thought it would be useful to start off by saying, what do we actually mean by onboarding? And broadly, it's the process of introducing a new asset owner to new art, whether they're a local authority or a telco or a utility or a transport provider, um, helping them understand what it is, the benefits and how we'd like to engage with them going forward. So it's, it's broadly the, the early part of the asset owner journey with new art. In terms of our approach, we had three strategic components for deciding who to engage with first. The first one, which is perhaps obvious, but it's to capitalize on existing momentum. Start off with people who are already interested and keen for this. London was picked as one of the first two pilot regions as there was already an existing pilot project with some key players like TfL and Thames Water who were already interested and jumped at the project. And in terms of signing up local authorities, we initially reached out to boroughs who either we were very, worked very closely with on infrastructure space or who we knew were digitally innovative and would, would jump at the chance for, to work on a kind of pioneering data project like this. The second key component is obtain senior sponsorship early. And we found that this was absolutely critical to unlock doors at the operational level. Um, we did this in two ways. One, the Mayor of London convenes the London Infrastructure Group. This is a group with CEO level representatives of all of the infrastructure providers across London. And we presented there on NUA and we got their senior buy-in from the outset. And that really um, introduced us to the right contacts. It meant when we had the initial meetings, we could say your CEO already supports that. And that really sped up the process. With local authorities, we engage with London councils and we also use the deputy mayor to reach out to leaders of local authorities across London and get that senior buy-in early. 
The final component was um, GC and GLA were, were already singing from the rooftops about new art, but also we used as many networks as we could to disseminate the message. So in the, the local infrastructure, uh, local authority space, we engaged with Lottie, the London Office of Technology Innovation, the London Infrastructure Group, London Councils, and we did a similar thing in the utility space too, so that more and more networks were sharing it to their engaged communities. Then once we get to the individual asset owner onboarding journey, it typically starts with an introductory call. Um, sometimes this takes a, a few times to find the right home within an asset owner. But once you've got the right contacts, it kind of kickstarts the main parts of the onboarding journey, which are the legal review and the data collection review. So the legal review is really important to review the, the data sharing agreements, which Guy already mentioned. And the data collection process, we like to start that as early as possible in the process. We don't want to wait until the legal agreement is signed to start talking about data collection. We try and run it concurrently. And the reason for that is twofold. The first is simply legal review takes a long time. Um, so we don't want to wait until it's signed to only then start talking about data collection. But secondly, having a greater understanding of the types of data that's being provided, what's going to be done to it in terms of the transformation process and who's going to be using it can really expedite and facilitate the legal review because then it means our new our contacts, when they give it to their legal team, they give them the bigger context and the bigger picture of how it's going to be used. Um, so that ends with the legal agreement being signed and the data being shared. <clears throat> in terms of the GLA's onboarding journey in London, so um, in 2019, um, we engaged with, with six local authorities um, for the pilots. We then moved into the preparation phase and we doubled our coverage to, to 12 local authorities. And then since the build phase started in September, we really um, you know, expanded our efforts and reached out to all 33 local authorities in London. And what's really incredible is that in just a few months, 22 of them have already signed legal agreements with us, many of whom have shared data. And the other 11 are all at different stages of legal review and engagement. So hopefully that, that map will turn green soon. Um, the, the key things to note, two, two things I want to highlight here are that the boroughs who've been with us since the beginning have stayed throughout. We haven't had any dropout. They're really bought into this. And the second is that some of the boroughs that we've only reached out to for the first time in the last few months have already shared data with us. So they're really, they know that NUAR is coming and they, they want to get ready and involved for that. Um, so Guy has already mentioned um, a lot of the benefits of, of, of NUAR um, for asset owners and for local authorities. And we've got listed here some of the key use cases. I'll just talk in a bit more detail about the benefit for local authorities and residents. NUAR will allow the sector to plan infrastructure more effectively. It will reduce the risk to life. It will reduce the, the risk of serious injuries and it will reduce widespread, widespread disruption caused when underground pipes and cables are struck by mistake. It will also create numerous indirect benefits, such as improving air quality, promoting healthier streets by reducing con congestion on the roads, and it will help to prevent costly delays associated with poor infrastructure planning. So I think what we've got here are the, the four use cases, but one thing that hasn't been said before is that when, when new R is built, local authorities will just get unprecedented access to underground asset data from across the whole sector alongside details of their own assets, and that's going to be super valuable. Um, just to kind of bring that to life for you, in uh, last year, um, we reached out to um, over 150 different stakeholders and tested the new R platform, both online and sometimes out on site. So we've got a picture here of the deputy mayor on site accessing new R on, on his tablet alongside an actual excavation. And you can see through from some of the quotes here that there is just huge enthusiasm and support and people really, they were biting our hands off to get access to this tomorrow if they could. Um, that being said, it's not been without some challenges, um, even with willing stakeholders, organisations are at different stages of technological and organisational maturity around data sharing, and it requires dedicated time to bring everyone on board um, to ensure consistency and data accuracy, and it's also just such a huge and diverse sector. Some of the key challenges are 
first one is a technical one, different data taxonomies and formats. And you can imagine that across the, the water, the gas, the power, the local authority, the telco sector, there's a, a vast range in kind of naming, data formats, attribution. So that highlighted the importance of having a, a common data model. Security concerns um, is also a key one that came up. And to respond to that, we've really embedded security throughout NUAR at every stage of the process. The next two um, key challenges are, are more cultural. Um, that we found sometimes there's a reluctance to share incomplete data and sometimes even embarrassment. Um, and, and we've worked a lot with asset owners to kind of say, you know, some, some data is better than nothing and um, it, it's fine <laughs> if, it, if it's incomplete. Um, the, the next cultural one is the kind of capabilities and approaches to data sharing. Some asset owners, they publish their data um, online, they wanted to set up APIs with us, and others are very unused to sharing data. So we've had to really tailor our approach depending on their cultural preference. Um, Perhaps less relevant for local authorities, but there have been competition concerns too in the utility sector. So to, to respond to that, we've had a very tight focus on the use cases and made sure that we're sharing only specific data to share with specific people to meet the specific use cases. We're not asking for any old data to share with anyone. And then the final one is regulation and legal constraints. So we've got a huge legal work stream and we've also worked with the regulators to, to, to address some of the concerns. And then final slide for me is some of the lessons learned. <clears throat> so I think the first two um, really are that there is just no one size fits all. Um, particularly with local authorities, we sometimes spoke with the head of data, we spoke with infrastructure teams, highways teams, GIS leads. It was a different role at, at every local authority. And, and we understand that local authorities have limited resource, they have competing priorities. So we really had to tailor our approach to be specific for each individual case and just not take a one size fits all approach. Related to that, um, we also found that local authorities have different data sets. Um, and sometimes it was in a centralized database, sometimes it was across multiple teams and functions. And so to respond to that, we created a, a very simple shopping list of data so that the, our key contacts were equipped to go out and speak to different parts of the organization and gather the data. Despite the diversity, we found some common onboarding lessons across all of the different stakeholders. The first one I've already mentioned is that senior sponsorship can significantly reduce the time for onboarding. Um, the, the next one is that legal review, uh, sorry, the benefit of connecting you with existing partners. And this was actually a really nice uh, finding from Nuar is that you know, if there was a local authority struggling with a legal process, we could put them in touch with another local authority who had signed and they were very happy to share the learning. Or one asset owner was vectorizing their data and struggling and we put them in touch with another one who had recently gone through that process. Um, then the next one, legal review uh, takes time, but many questions can be answered by providing the information upfront and setting the proper context. Um, Number six is very important, is, is the need for people. Um, and it really helps to have a dedicated coordinator because new R entails input from the legal, the technical side, the highway side. So having someone who's well connected really speeds things up. And then the final two lessons relate more from the technical aspect. So um, really, um, we need to be flexible in terms of data refresh rates. And we need to understand that different data sets vary and we, we need to accommodate that. And then the final one is to engage with technical contacts early. It, it's never too early to, to start, how, start having a data workshop and set the scene in terms of the data ask. Um, that, that's it from me. I'll hand over to Bob now to talk more about the data acquisition journey. Excellent. Thank you. So I'll build on some of the experiences that um, Guy and Helen have been talking about to give you some practical examples of what's happening so people can, can start to understand what to expect. Um, and also to build on, I think it came up in both Guy and what Helen was saying, the momentum we've built up right from the early pilots, which is an important thing that I might need to remember. And then the speed with which, Guy, you were saying that like the 600 plus that we need to engage, the momentum is huge. And the lessons we're learning as we build up that momentum is, is incredible. Mm. So we're making the, the whole, um, or what we're trying to achieve is make sure that whole experience for the asset owners is just getting better and better as, as we keep, keep up that momentum. 
So the first thing I wanted to just, just make sure is that everyone understands when we start that, that data collection, that data engagement conversations, you know, as early as we can, which is something that Helen was saying, trying to do it earlier and earlier, gives us, gives us that opportunity to start to work out how we can kind of reduce any sort of burden or, or risk or, or stress or tasks on the actual asset owners. So the way we've adopted it, even though we know and we've discovered and we, we understood from the pilot stage, there's so much data in different formats and structures, but actually we've got quite a good process, as Helen was saying, we know what data we actually need to deliver what new art needs from a use case perspective. So although there's a range of things we have to deal with, we can pretty much take the data in your structure and your format and we will deal with the rest of it. That's what we've been, been, been designing the systems and the process and actual actually the teams as well to allow us to do all that. We're also something that Helen just mentioned to make sure what we're building is completely flexible and not only simple to use and nice and secure, but the flexibility around when you then agree the frequency of how quickly you'll re-upload or refresh the data, again, is entirely down to um, what we agree with the different asset owners. And we'll get a whole range of um, frequency rates that the update will happen. But again, it goes back to something that we mentioned already. Having access to some of the data is definitely more beneficial than not having access to the data, especially when you consider the scale of the job that we're doing. Having a few extra marginal gains to help us build out a full picture of, of this um, national asset that we were creating in, in the National Underground Asset Register is huge. And then the third example where, again, Guy talked about some of the key enablers around the agreements about when we will actually take the data and make it available. Sharing and giving us access to the data early. Until those agreements are in place, we've got all the right checks and balances which we will need, we will go through before any of the data that we start working with is shared externally. So there's no re, no need to worry about the risk of, of any of that um, going out and not being not following those checks and balances. So the data journey that we're taking people on, it really it, it transitions from some of, some of the engagement that particularly um, Helen was talking about right through to what what we're doing on the technical side to build that repeatable and sustainable automated process that Guy mentioned. So identifying what source data is required for new R. So we've got some information around the shopping list and things, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Making sure we can get access to some of that data um, from, from the asset owners that we're engaging with. Giving that ability to upload the data in a nice, secure, safe way so we can get it into the technical teams looking at the the schema harmonization and the transformation work. And that gives us a really early insight to do the schema harmonization, which is saying, well, we've accessed your data in your structure, in your file formats that comes out of your systems in the easiest way possible for you. And we'll take on the task of mapping that into the model that underpins the new R system. So we'll build that also in a nice repeatable rules-based way so that when you re-engage and go through the user experience of using the new R service in the future, it will all be set up ready for you. The rules will run and they'll do all the things that we've tested and built during, during this first phase. Then once we've built those rules, the transformation, like I said, will just automatically happen. The data will be processed, the system will be updated. But again, the engagement early on is key for us to keep that momentum going and it won't be until those key enablers, so the data adjustment specification and the data distribution agreements have been signed and agreed with yourselves and, uh, and with, with the entire con consortium that will then be going into the sort of the business as usual flow. So, and the reason we're all presenting today is that we were involved, you know, as an entire consortium the last few days, just making sure as we get more people involved and the momentum builds up, that at each one of those touch points, we're constantly having a look to see what improvements can we make to go even faster? So what happens when we first do some of those data um, collection sessions and run those data workshops? Well, we've got a bit of a, you know, a data ask for people. We've got some narrative that we go through to explain what we need and what information we think the different types of asset owners might have. We put together a um, 
usually like a one hour session where we'll then talk in a little bit more detail about what's required. The shopping list idea has, has been quite popular that we've been building out and, and constantly refining. So almost turning up to the conversation and saying, well, these are the types of bits of information you may have that would be really useful to contribute to, to newer. We can then go through each of those um, and on a one-on-one -on -one basis, capture all that information. And then something that I'll, I'll mention in a minute, importantly, write all this down for you and document it and send it back to you. So it's information and almost a little audit routine that you can take back into your own organization and get, uh, you know, and use that to, for your own business. So what actually gets uploaded, like I say, the data will be provided to us from yourselves in your own format and structure. We also ask for a little bit of um, additional information about the data that's being provided. So there's some sort of mand mandatory information that we need to know about. So what's the coverage that we're looking at? What are the um, contact details for, for this? So there, there's some key things and key almost compliance metrics that we put in place as well as the, the digital data. But all this gets captured and documented and it will end up in the, in the um, the data information specification, injustice specification that will be provided back to you at the end. What we first do actually, once we receive the data, so you can imagine after we've had the, the data discovery session and those conversations about what data may be available and then what is provided, we've got some routines that we go through to almost provide a sanity check of what's been, what has been sent. So any little assumptions that we may have made in those early conversations, we can get those written down and agreed and, and clarified. The transformation then happens, and, and that's where, you know, in the exam, simple example we've got here, you may be managing some data called archaeological interest areas. You may have an attribute or a space in your system where you store the notes about that. Whereas we know in the new R system, we've got something we call an archaeological site, and that contains a description. So we go through and make sure we understand how we, how we map that data together. And with the range of data we've seen and we are expecting from the different asset owners, there's then a need to go back with a few clarification questions to make sure we get the mapping right and we get it all agreed. And all this is supported from the, from the team's perspective using various automated and machine learning techniques to make sure we can do this as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. So what then happens once we've produced it that? Well, one of the tasks is the data does end up in a big repository in a database, which is what will then be used to facilitate the delivery of that information back out. So as Guy said, back out to the systems that you then end up using, be that phones, tablets, desktops, all that sort of stuff. But another really key part of the output as well, which like I say, I think is really useful for the asset owners who have had some good feedback from the engagement so far is around this data ingestion specification. So everything that we do and automate we write down and document. So we explain what we did to the data. We provide feedback on what we found out about the data. And we'll look to make sure that you're in control of that as well. So we're looking to make sure that gets signed off by yourself so you understand what it is we've done and what it is that we found out. But building up that data feedback, like I said, it's, it's really producing a really rich data catalog of your holding and information about that, which you can use to take back into your own organization to start building out or contributing to your own data governance processes. And finally, some of the next sort of steps. Well, like I mentioned a few times, Guy was talking about the key enablers to say, and all this is going to be safe and secure until we get to that final DDA being signed. That's when we'll be able to make sure that access to the data is provided in the right secure and safe way and all the right as I mentioned, checks and balances have taken place before we make that happen. We'll also be providing the ability to asset owners to refresh their data, and as Helen said, on a nice flexible basis, you know, as frequently as they can, to be able to access the system to provide new updates or even start to think about whether they want to, to provide things like API access to the data that they've got to, to speed up the frequency. When that happens, there'll also be some uh, nice dashboard features within the systems that will allow you to go back in and track and check to see when uploads were made to new R, what happened when the uploads were made, 
have a look at our feature counts going up. So again, com contributing back to that data ingestion specification or back into your own business. So you're, you're tracking um, what you've got, how you manage it, what the quality levels are of it, but all within your own dashboard view for your, for your own benefit. And then, like I said, that live stream of data directly from um, the asset owners are also features that we'll be building into the system, which will start to become available as we roll out the entire um, new R service. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Helen. Thank you very much too. Um, thank you all kind of for listening today. Um, new R is a really big, complex um, uh, and challenging project, and it's hard to kind of compress our story into kind of 30, 35 minutes. So um, hopefully, however, we've managed to give you some appreciation and a taste of, of what the project is. And, and, and maybe we've even kind of sparked your interest to kind of come and find out more and discover more about the project. NUAR really is an in, important project. Um, there is a big benefit and opportunity to be, to be kind of gained and to be had. Um, NUAR will be the only one-stop shop for obtaining all underground asset data in one place, sort of within an instant, and that that data will be um, kind of fresh and reliable and the, and the latest possible data. It's going to be the only platform and system that will do that. Will, that, will do that. Um, more than that, NUAR is also, it's a bellwether project. Um, to show the benefits and the, and the value that comes from data sharing. Um, and sharing data between organisations, but between private sector and public sector. And if we can kind of demonstrate the value and benefit that comes from that through NUAR, there will be other, other use cases and other um, opportunities to kind of get value from that data sharing. The NUAR safety case is just the start um, of, of the kind of value journey. Ultimately, the platform and the, and the aggregation of the data, it's gonna, it's gonna provide a really powerful resource and foundation for future digital transfer, transformation and use cases. And I touched on one of those in, in my present, in part of the presentation about the coordination of street works, for example, earlier. But there are many more potential use cases and completing this new R project is going to be the key, the kind of the key to that future. Um, uh, we're kind of clearly biased, however, about the kind of the benefits of new R, and I just wanted to sort of end on this last slide because it's not just us. Okay, there are plenty of um, people of um, influence and, and from other organisations outside of the project uh, who are advocates for this for what we're doing. And, and a few of them are on the screen here. So listen, thank you very much again for listening to, to our talk today. Um, we've got time now for some, some of your questions, which hopefully we'll be able to answer. If you um, are unable to ask a question today or, or something springs to mind after, after you've um, heard, this, heard this presentation, then please do reach out. You can reach out to any one of us directly um, or you can use the contact details that are on the screen here. Um, and we'll all be really happy to help you. So again, thank you for listening and um, back to you, Robin. Great, thanks, Guy. So we have got a little bit of time, um, but I, they're perhaps going to be short, sharp answers, I think. So um, I'll start with Bob. What is the time investment to complete the data transformation? Obviously, this is going to take people, take time. Yeah, so, there, there, so there's some tasks for us to do where we kind of take the pain away for a few weeks while we work out all the transformations, but there is a bit of work up front. Usually the data workshops are around an hour session that we might have where we start probing a little bit about from the shopping list of data that might be available, just working out, is it available? As Helen said, lots of people are at different maturity levels across the just which is expected across this vast range of asset owners that we're dealing with. But after that workshop, then there's... There could be a few clarification questions that we need to, to, to go backwards and forwards with. But the process we've built up to document all this and share it means that it is quite an efficient 
process from the from that engagement piece. Get into that engagement piece is another matter. And then, like I say, there's there's a bit of work on, on our side to build the transformations, but do we do know, and we have experience from some of the asset owners, there's a bit of time on their side then to kind of go away and, and gather the data that is available. And I know that's varied across some of the asset owners. Yeah. yeah. Um, question to uh, sorry, we're just sorry, Helen. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna rock through yeah. these questions. Yeah. We've got quite a lot coming in. So uh, but there's some important ones here. So, Guy, will it be mandatory to provide data to newer? So, at the moment, it's not it's not mandatory. Um, the Geospatial Commission and Cabinet Office is going out to consultation later in the year to to consider the the need to to try and take a mandatory approach. Um, but at the moment, we we're really hopeful that the the, the sort of the, the benefit case or the value case. Um, is really, you know, is really clear and demonstrable to all the people that need to take part, and therefore, you know, everyone will be willing to kind of participate and, and join in. And I guess a follow-up to that is, who, are people liable if they provide poor date quality data, or if NewR has mistakes on it? There must are there some liability issues? Well, Rob, there's a really, really um, important question that comes up quite often. So. So what NUAR doesn't do, it doesn't change any of the, the kind of the liabilities um, uh, for anybody, okay? So, because what all we're doing is we are um, representing the data that is already exists and already comes from those asset owners. So we're not seeking to change that data. We're not going to be improving the quality of that data or, move, or, or adjusting in any way. So, so the existing kind of place for liabilities will be will, will, will be where they are now. They won't they won't change going forwards. Okay. Question for Helen. Um, when will NUA be approved for planning teams to access? So I think Guy already mentioned that you know as we're gathering all of this underground asset data, um, the the potential new use cases that there's a long list of them. So for planning, for infrastructure coordination, for resilience, and so on. Um, for the time being, we're keeping a close focus on the current use cases for, for security concerns and for buy-in, um, but we do have these additional use cases which are, are included in the, the legal framework to potentially add on in time, and the Geospatial Commission will be um, seeking views for this in the consultation which Guy mentioned that's going out um, in, in spring of this year. Okay, brilliant. Who's going to have access to the information in NUAR? I'll take that, shall I? Um, so the, uh, the current plan um, and is that NUAR will be um, available to the asset owners. So, so asset owners will be able to log in and create an account and then use the platform, um, but also that they will then be able to make, that, make it available to their supply chain. Um, so if you've got, you know, um, I don't, organizations or contractors that, that work in your for your organization that need to kind of the same information that they will be, they will then be able to access NUAR um, to, to get that data. So that's that's the current plan. Brilliant. Question here about sort of keeping it up to date. Um, how will you ensure that that so people sort of download their data to you once if this is what we've got? How will you then ensure that kind of it keeps up to date? Do you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that. So one of the, the features we're building into the system and to, to keep it um, nice and flexible, there's, there's two routes. Some asset owners have already been talking about providing access to interfaces that they already have. So programmatically for hours to access the data when, when we need it. So that gives us a, a total control over the flexibility and, and how frequent it happens. But then we've also, to make sure we cover everybody, the asset owners themselves will be able to log in when they want to provide that new refresh. And importantly, we're going to be capturing what those, those predicted and sort of initial estimated refresh rates will be for all asset owners for the whole thing. So we'll be able to make sure we can be, we can be flexible, but also manage it. So we'll understand what's happening and when. Question here. Are you talking to any works management systems that may ingest this data for end users? Uh, not, not at the moment. No, we're we're, we're focused on 
the, the, the primary use case, which is around the safety case, so making the data available to people that log into the system. But what you just touched on there is, you know, the opportunity potentially for kind of future, kind of future benefit and future use cases. Brilliant. Um, question here, uh, the scope of this work seems to be wider than just underground assets. Includes brownfield sites, for example, where can we find the latest spec and all the data being captured and published for new R? Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, generally it is underground assets, but we are capturing some data with overground components. Um, the overall data ask is, is broadly any data that would be useful for an excavator when they're out on site doing a dig. So that th things like um, tree preservation orders or lamp posts or even you know where you tie your bike up on a, a bike rack, that kind of data, they're obviously overground, but it's very valuable for an excavator to have sight of that before they go on site. Brilliant. Okay, well, I think that's probably it for questions. Thank you so much for rattling through so many. Thank you to everyone who uh, has uploaded a question during the presentation. Uh, the, our, our presenters have all said they're very happy to be followed up with and ask specific questions. I, I, I hope everyone on this call agrees that new R is a great thing and that we should all support it and make it happen and overcome any blockages or difficulties. Uh, just uh, you've got sort of 60 seconds for any final thoughts from our three presenters. Well, just, I mean, just to, so you just said, hopefully, you know, people can get behind the project. You know, this is, it's, it's really important. We're all really passionate about it. We've, we've all been involved in the sort of the run up to this project um, for a number of years. Um, it is important. It is exciting. Um, so hopefully we'll get to, to, to speak to some of the people on the call in the, in the near future. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.